The end of 2017 turned out a number of very good movies. The Oscar nominees for Best Picture include some exceptional examples of creative visual storytelling, thought-provoking messages, and themes that reflect our world on a deeper level than we might even realize at first. So let's dig in and take a look at what's most innovative and striking about some of the year's best pictures. Before we go on, we wanted to tell you a little bit about this video's sponsor, Skillshare, which is a really great online learning community. They've got classes on everything we love, video production, writing, photography. If you're one of the first 500 people to sign up with our link in the description below, you get two months access to all their classes for just 99 cents. Now, back to the Oscars. Director Guillermo del Toro has said that The Shape of Water is his personal favorite out of all the films he's made. It's the movie I like the most that I've ever made. I think is the best movie. It's also one of his most popular. Adult audiences might find it revitalizing to be spoken to in the cinematic language of fairy tales. But about mature themes. It's a fairy tale for troubled times, and it's an adult fairy tale. So this is not an escapist fairy tale. It's a fairy tale that reflects history and the present with brutal honesty. Some of the best minds in the country peeing all over the floor in this here facility. Mm, mm, mm. There's pee freckles on the ceiling now. How'd I get it up there? Del Toro is exposing the fact that many classic fairy tales are actually pretty disturbing when you look at them closely. Here, Del Toro is choosing to lean in to the darkness and complexity. Underneath his pristine early 60s setting, Del Toro is revealing that our nostalgic images of that era tend to be idealistic fantasies that gloss over the wickedness and conflict in our country's past. Meanwhile, Del Toro is showing us that you can talk about these serious adult themes through beautiful cinematic forms, imagery that expresses the magic and wonder that are also part of our lives. Just because we're all grown up, our stories don't all have to look like office space. And Del Toro's earnest love of cinema and what the medium can do is evident in every frame. The director has said that as a kid, when he watched Creature from the Black Lagoon, he was surprised and sad that the creature didn't get the girl in the end. I hope they end up together. Uh, but they didn't. The Shape of Water's joyful interspecies romance makes us look back at some of those older movies with new eyes. The film urges us to ask if some of these monsters of the past were actually misunderstood or wrongfully demonized. So it's sending a larger message about how marginalized people in our society get villainized by our collective stories written by the winners of history. The thing we keep in there is an affront. And I should know, I dragged it all the way here. And the story is subtly empowering those characters who are different. It's framing them as agents of progress on the right side of history. One pattern we can see in a lot of Oscar-winning movies is that they often feature characters who refuse to fall in line with society's expectations. Even more importantly, those characters surprise us. They don't fit neatly into the character types and repeat the same cliches that we might expect going into a movie. Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri has this surprise quality in spades. The surprises in Three Billboards come from within people within ourselves. And it's thanks to really nuanced performances from Frances McDormand, Sam Rockwell, and Woody Harrelson that we buy such extreme turnarounds from these characters in the relatively short length of the movie. We're surprised that Mildred's badass fury is really a very tender grief. And we're surprised when we see in flashbacks that her anger also preceded her daughter's death, and it complicated her ability to show love all along. I hope I get raped on the way. Yeah, well, I hope you get raped on the way too. Chief Willoughby surprises us and Mildred by responding to her personal attack on him with compassion and humor. I thought it'd be funny, you having to defend him a whole nother month after they've stuck me in the ground. Meanwhile, Dixon is the biggest surprise of all when he proves that underneath that total numbskull, there's a potentially good person. I'm sorry I got your hopes up. That's all right, that's all right. Throughout, the film also shocks us in how it uses edgy, daring humor, which many people feel is one of the best things about it. Hey, f it. What? Don't say what? Dixon, when she comes in, calling you a f The lesson of the film again catches us off guard in how positive it is. The glimmer of hope we see is that the characters are finally learning to be more compassionate and to accept kindness from those around them. Be nice to her, Charlie. You got that. Director Martin McDonough named the fictional Missouri town Ebbing 
which makes us think of ebbs and flows. And in the film, we see anger gradually ebbing or receding. And in its place, there's a resurgence of loving kindness. So both Three Billboards and The Shape of Water are trying to address the state of our country today but they couldn't be more different in the ways they go about it. Three Billboards takes a sharp, head-on approach through incorrect humor and furious characters driving a confrontational plot. Just then put an end to shit, you f***ing retard. This is just a start. Meanwhile, the shape of water is reaching us almost in the way a dream does. When we're dreaming, our defenses are down, and we absorb the meaning of the dream without understanding everything consciously. And one of the great powers of cinema is that it has the ability to penetrate us emotionally in the same way. Get Out is a masterful social horror in the tradition of The Stepford Wives and Rosemary's Baby. It draws on the greatness of those past classics to produce a wholly original and much needed social commentary for our times. Black is in fashion. The title comes from an Eddie Murphy comedy bit about how a black character would immediately leave a haunted house as soon as they noticed something was off. A black family comes into a haunted house. I think it's Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Comes in the haunted house and, oh, oh this, these drapes are great. And they get out. Too bad we can't stay, baby. The implication is that a black person has to be hyper aware of the danger in this world just to survive. Whereas the horror genre is built around naive, blindly trusting characters. You like scary movies? Uh huh. Putting a black character center stage in a horror movie, which is dealing with these questions, Get Out is subtly revolutionizing the genre. Zadie Smith pointed out that the film gets a lot of its power from inversions, which are a strong source of both social insight and comedy. So from the start, the story inverts the old cliche of white characters locking their car doors or getting nervous when they find themselves in a quote-unquote bad neighborhood. Where are all the white people? Instead, Get Out starts with a black man walking through a picturesque suburb, and we feel tense. It's reminding white people that they can be the scary ones. There's too many white people, I get nervous, you know. <laughs> What's so subversive about the film is that the target of the satire is white liberals. By the way, I, I would have voted for Obama for a third term if I could. Best president in my lifetime, hands down. These are people who would be shocked at being called racist, who probably think of themselves as pretty woke that you don't have to give him your ID because you haven't done anything wrong. Who are the very ones watching this movie and loving it? He was saying a joke about, oh, I would have voted for Obama three times. Yeah. The new version of that is, I've watched Get Out three times. But the movie's revealing that some of these same people may have deeper, internalized prejudices that are pretty terrifying. When it comes down to it, many people are willing to go to great lengths to preserve their privilege, no matter what their surface-level politics are. Your existence will be as a passenger. An audience. You'll live in the sunken place. All of this makes Get Out a landmark film in so many ways. I have touched you for the last time. The most famous LGBTQ love stories to date tend to have a tragic tone and focus on fighting a homophobic world. Meanwhile, famous heterosexual movie romances are full of aspirational scenes, emphasizing the beauty and desire of a couple discovering each other. So what's striking about Call Me By Your Name is it depicts a relationship between two men in the style of a classic movie romance, with joy and luxurious sensuality. And in doing this, it sends a powerful emotional message that love is love. Love is love is love is love. The romance in Call Me By Your Name is in fact so aspirational that it's almost an over-the-top bourgeois fantasy. The leads are both extremely handsome and sophisticated and charming, spending their summer lounging in this ridiculously beautiful Italian villa. Call Me By Your Name is set in the 80s, but the setting also feels timeless, exempt from the forward motion of the rest of the world. We see this in the way that anthropology and history are woven into the story. These shots of the ancient statues are playing up the beauty of the male form, and they're also subtly recalling a time in history when it was socially acceptable for men to publicly take younger male lovers. Not a straight body in these statues, they're all curved. Sometimes impossibly curved, and so nonchalant, hence their ageless ambiguity, as if they're daring you to desire them. We escape into this very free, educated community where everyone speaks multiple languages and is reading all the time, or else maybe playing the piano, swimming, or eating a soft-boiled egg. 
It's a kind of temporary idyllic paradise, a utopia. Some people have actually criticized this film for not being political enough. Director Luca Guadagnino has said, I didn't want the audience to find any difference or discrimination toward these characters. It was important to me to create this powerful universality. But there may be a deeper, subtly political message in what Call Me By Your Name doesn't say and in its idealized quality. The story is set in the early 80s, which is right around the time the AIDS epidemic was beginning in the US. So it's as if this was a kind of innocent time when two men could have this kind of relationship without having to face the tragedy that was to come soon after. Guaranino is planning to make a sequel that picks up in the late 80s and actually touches on the AIDS epidemic. So Call Me By Your Name gives us a kind of beautiful, calm moment before any of that. And we sense that the whole reason Elio and Oliver can have this joyful relationship is because they're in the bubble of this open European society, in the shelter of Elio accepting parents. Meanwhile, the obstacles to their relationship are very much present. They're just internalized and off-screen. So by the end, we see that this fantasy has to end. Oliver has to go home and be closeted again because he believes that he must. Most of all, it's truly in the universality of the romance that Call Me By Your Name sends its biggest message. It's a coming-of-age story that anyone can relate to. It's about Elio's sentimental education, how he learns that both pleasure and pain make life worth living. And by the end, we feel like we've learned these lessons firsthand with him. Our hearts and our bodies are given to us only once. And before you know it, your heart's worn out. Next up, stay tuned for part two, where we analyze what's most striking and innovative about the rest of the Best Picture nominees. Hi guys, this is Susanna. We at Screen Prism are all about lifelong learning. We're always trying to improve our knowledge of film and visual culture. So we're really into Skillshare. Their online learning community offers over 18,000 classes, all for less than $10 a month. Right now, they're offering a pretty amazing deal. You can get two months access to all of their classes for just 99 cents total. But that's only if you're one of the first 500 people to click on our link in the description below. So yeah, if you want that deal, hurry up. We really like their classes on film, like cinematography, how to make your film look like a movie. Not to mention all their classes on business, design, photography, writing. These are some big distinguished teachers coming to you through your computer screen. So if you want to take your work or your art to the next level, try Skillshare. Click the link in our description below, head over to Skillshare.com, and start filling your brains with the knowledge you need to develop all the skills you ever wanted.